I'm stuck there. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about the... Oh, what's happened there? That was slightly worrying. I hope he's not going to do what he did to Laura. Um, I'm going to take you, tell you about the urine assay. So if, before I do that, this is the crowd of huge number of people who are behind what I'm about to tell you. And I'd like to just particularly pick out Jill, who is at the back of the room and is there. Because everything, when I say I did something, actually Jill did it. I just take the credit. Um, so, so Jill has been absolutely fantastic in organising this session with this whole uh, day with Tracy. And thank you, Jill, for doing that. Um, I wasn't going to show this, but since it was referred to earlier, I, I hope this room all knows that if you take aspirin, you reduce your risk of colorectal cancer. And we have nice guidance for that, but we'll be hearing later it's still not into play fully yet. And then last September, we finally got the other half of CAP2 published which showed that uh, a high fiber diet reduced the non-colorectal cancers by 60%. Uh, and we talked about a little bit about this last year, but basically you take a high fiber diet, it's good and it's not dangerous. And we will be telling you next year that we've finished CAP3 almost uh, next spring, but we won't have the results until we've put all the numbers together. But we're basically comparing the three doses uh, and we're now funded through to 2025 to complete that study to find out what the best dose of aspirin is. Okay, so um, what about testing um, for uh, Lynch syndrome in the urine? Well, first of all, let me just backtrack to the development of this assay. Um, so about 10 years ago, uh, we were looking at this challenge of how do we find all the missing Lynch syndrome, syndrome patients? And it was clear that we needed to be doing something a bit slicker uh, on screening tumors, particularly colorectal tumors. You've already heard we can look for the proteins uh, and those are shown in that top left hand corner, or we can do MSI testing. Um, now, the proteins work most of the time, not always, um, but there is a significant issue that only 3% of our cell pathology departments in, in the country are actually fully staffed. So it's a huge, it's an extra burden on them. Uh, and it's a pretty expensive test from Tristan and Ian's um, study many years ago. So it's a good test but it put, presents some challenges and of course after you do that test you then have to do a molecular test to sort out which ones go for germline testing so it's a kind of two-stage process <clears throat> on the top right is the microsatellite instability testing using the old method uh, developed by promega which has been the workhorse for 20 years but it uses an old style technology because the what you're looking for is changes in the lengths of bits of repetitive dna but the five bits that they use in that assay <coughs> excuse me will not work on our next generation machines. So it has to be done as a separate test rather than just putting it into the, the main mix. You can just sequence the tumor and you can analyze what's called the mutational signature of an MSI high tumor, but that's expensive and it's slow. Uh, and you know we're already struggling to get everything through the molecular labs as it is. And the final way forward is to select particular bits of DNA which are anal analyzable using our next gen machines and look for changes in their length that are out with the normal variation so you can see here there's always a little bit of variation but when you get all sorts of different lengths it's clearly it's clear you've got a major spelling mistake and that's sign of, of mismatch repair deficiency so that's what we set out to invent and i say we actually i mean them um, and so mauro is a computational biologist mike is a molecular biologist and and these are our phd students richard's now a postdoc and this is basically the essence. So here you've got eight G's in a row and you've accidentally put seven in instead. So that's a slippage and that's real. And what we had to work out was how we differentiate that, a real change, from what's called PCR stutter, where the, the amplification just a bit wobbly, which has caused all those funny jig jag peaks. And we've done it. So we basically identified a whole set of markers uh, which are exquisitely sensitive in between genes, so it doesn't matter which tissue you look at, and they will pick up uh, this um, microsatellite instability. But the, crucially, because it's going through our next-gen machines, we can also chuck in a whole bunch of other stuff, particularly this BRAF mutation. I'm not going to go into all the science of this, but basically, if you've got a BRAF mutation, you probably don't have Lynch syndrome. And so when we're trying to target ourselves, if you're a BRAF negative, MSI high, then that's the group we want to do the Lynch syndrome testing on. And that gets you down to about a one in three score rate when you do the germline testing. 
And so this is some work just to prove that it works. This is not the old test needed an expert eye to interpret. This is absolutely barn door. So the green ones are the stable colorectal cancers, the red ones are the unstable, and you can see we can very clearly separate them on the biopsy blocks. These are the little snips that are taken from colon cancers uh, when you do your endoscopy. And what we do is just take a slice of the whole block and then analyze the so-called composite curl, uh, which is that set of black dots. Just to prove how sensitive it is, we actually tested great cost and faffing around for Christine and the team, every single biopsy. And as you'd expect, sometimes the endoscopist misses the tumor. And so you get an MS stable biopsy, individual biopsy. But in fact, even these two here were labeled as not having any tumor content, but were still MSI positive, or one of them was on the borderline. But of course, if you just take a slice of all of them, then you don't need to worry about tumor content. So we now, Everywhere in our region, all the pathologists just take three slices of every, two, every biopsy block that they get through and send them into us for analysis. And uh, these, and Helen and Lee were the first people, Lee's one of our trainees, uh, to put this into practice on the top left. And here on the bottom right here, Lizzie Solis from Sheffield wrote some beautiful software. So this is what the lab, lab scientist sees. It basically said, this is an MSI high, it's way above the line. Uh, we don't even say high and low anymore, it's just MSI, and it's BRAF positive, so we're not going to act on this one. If it was BRAF negative, then we'd say do Lynch testing. But we also chuck in, just for good measure, all of the other RAS mutations, because that helps you decide, for the oncologists, they have to decide which drugs to give you if you've got cancer. And if you've got a drive, one of these driver mutations, like BRAF, then there's a certain class of drugs that won't work. So this is useful extra information. So you're getting all for the price of one. Uh, and uh, we've now got that in routine practice across our region. So with Kieran, my partner in crime in the M uh, NHS, we put in a grant and got a grant from what's called the SBRI program from NHS England to give a technologist to every genome uh, laboratory hub, although two of them subsequently turned it down uh, for reasons I won't go into now. Uh, and so we've actually recycled that money into the Lynch nursing work uh, that you heard about earlier. Uh, and basically, we've now rolled this out across the top half of northeastern Yorkshire. It's now into West Yorkshire. It's now established in Northwest. Uh, and it's established in North Thames and Southwest. So we're just about getting it into practice. One of the problems we ran into at the beginning was that we designed it so it took two days to do the lab work. And then we reinvented it thanks to the work of another one of our PhD students, Rachel. So this is a great idea from Mauro. A very, about one in a million children is born having got Lynch syndrome from both parents and survived. And those children get cancer in childhood. Uh, and so we reason, we were we, our test will actually pick that up in their bloodstream. So it's actually a useful test in that rare condition. But also, because we were doing DNA testing on those kids, Mauro said, why don't we do a whole genome sequence on one, some of these children and find out which are the most likely markers to be unstable in their blood? Because they'll be the best markers for our assay. And so it was. So basically, uh, looking at, this is a bit of a complicated slide, looking left to right, is our old set of markers between the stable and the unstable. Looking top to bottom is our new set of markers co comparing stable to unstable. You see the separation is massively bigger. So it's much less likely to give you a, 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 an uncertain result. So that we fed that into our assay. It meant we could shorten the assay to a one day cycle. And so we can now turn the whole thing around in seven days. So the samples taken from the endoscopy the samples are cut, sent to us, the result is back with the, N with the MDT uh, within seven working days, which allows them to then act on it and refer the patient for blood sampling. And so we've just done an analysis with another of our star team, Patricia, one who did a master's with us and has moved over into the diagnostic lab. And before she got promoted, Patricia was doing all of this for the whole three million population of the Northeast and North Cumbria on her own, basically, because this assay gives such yes and no results. So it's very cheap and fast. But you can see that the impact, you heard from Fiona earlier, how we were right back at the beginning, taking a long time to get all the way to a result. And you can see in six month blocks, as we've got this into play, we've started to come down. And the best numbers are from Northumberland, still quite small numbers, but their first six cases where the nurse specialist collects the blood sample while they're still in the hospital and sends it down to us for analysis, then we send them an appointment if, if they've got a positive result. 
we're basically down to a three month, well, 21 days from the report to the germline test being activated and a, a total of 104 days from the MSI high report to a germline report. So that's really good going. Uh, and this is what we need to see across the whole country so that you're actually getting this done when you're in the hospital having your operation. So we've got a really much slicker pathway now and we're trying to roll that out nationally. So what about urine? Well, once we got this new assay up and running, I realized that this was so sensitive we could use it for what we call liquid biopsy. And I talked about this last year. This is Alan, one of the recruits for our CAP3 study. And he was being looked after by Adam in Guise and who contacted me to say that, that Alan had a tumor and he agreed to have his picture taken for our slides. And so Alan um, very happily provided us with samples. Now, this is a slightly different slide. What we're looking at here is the variant allele frequency. So how many of those other peaks there were for each marker? And you can see that in, in the before, um, the, in the blood, it all looked normal, like it did uh, after the operation. But his pre-op urines were all over the place. So there was lots of those abnormal peaks. And when we got the tumor out, it was the same. And, and once we took the tumor out, all of those markers went away. Uh, and there's just picking one of those markers. You can see how dramatically different it was in the urine and in the tumor. So essentially, the, opera, the urine uh, is reflecting the tumor in his kidney. So we've got a test that works. The question is how sensitive and specific. Almost certainly extremely specific compared to hematuria. This is, all, is almost certainly going to be coming out of a tumor. Um, but the question is how sensitive will it be? So um, this is my view of the four genes, um, of the apologies to the famous band. Um, and you've already heard that in fact MSH2 is the one we're particularly interested in for the kidney cancers. So 18.3%, according to our international prospective database uh, of the MSH2 gene carriers, in their lifetime will get an upper tract cancer. Now remember, these are treatable and operable, and a lot of these people will notice blood in their urine or something. So, you know, it sounds horrible, but a lot of them, you know, will get picked up in time. But clearly, the longer it sits there, the bigger is the chance that you won't recover from it and about 10% get bladder cancer. So that's a huge proportion, about a third of people with MSH2 will get a problem in their urinary tract. And as you heard from Rakesh, we're not doing anything about it. With Fiona's help, we looked at the 2018 data, 10,000 urinary tract cancers, only 43 of them could we find it had a germline test. So basically this was just a blind spot in the system. So Rebecca uh, is uh, going to pop up here. So there's Rakesh looking a bit fresher. Uh, and Rebecca Hall is one of our trainees in genetics and she's doing her MD. Uh, and she is, we've set up a clinic for our MSH2 gene carriers uh, and invited them in. And then we're going to do a health economic analysis with Gurdeep Sagu, uh, who is one of our uh, um, population uh, experts and, and with his colleague uh, Yaneth uh, Rojas, uh, who is going to do the analysis to see whether this is a cost-effective approach, which it almost certainly is. You can imagine this is way cheaper than all of those other things that you saw being offered before. I'm not, not going to talk about this except to say you've heard from Rakesh, it doesn't work. Um, and in fact, we were involved in that 2008 study that Torben did for, that you saw highlighted. Just when I showed you this slide last year, just when we got this rolling and we got the sam samples from Alan, I got this email from one of a patient I'd seen some years ago. And I, had to, I realized, Jill will tell you I normally don't reply to my hundreds of emails, but I got this one at 11.51 on the 9th of November and I replied to her at 12.54. So I obviously was very excited by this because what um, this patient was telling me was that she had the gene, MLH1, and I, I'd seen her with her parents uh, or with her father 10 years earlier to give her the diagnosis. She'd been bleeding, had menstrual bleeding for six months, abnormal menstrual bleeding at the age of 38. Uh, and she'd been to a GP, she eventually got an ultrasound, they said she had a polyp or a fibroid, I should say, in her womb, and she was going through the change of life and not to worry. She's a scientist, she said, I've got MLH1, so she booked herself a private gynae appointment just when she emailed me. So I spoke to the gynecologist, the gynecologist was equally reassuring, but we got a urine sample and a vaginal swab. Uh, and the, this is what it showed. Uh, there's a mouth swab showing what the normal markers should look like. Here is her tumor. Here is the swab from her vagina. And here are two different uh, DNA pre preparation sample tubes. 
absolutely grossly abnormal. So we got her in as an emergency and she had a high grade endometrial cancer. She had a hysterectomy and radiotherapy and she's getting married today. <laughs> so um, this is where we are. So you've already heard from Jean and in fact it's been a fast moving week because I've been uh, met with Jean just a few days ago, spoke with Emma, her supervisor, and you heard already about the collie piece. So we're gonna, we haven't worked out quite yet, have we, Jean? But, but basically, if they're gonna do the cytology, we clearly need to do this DNA test on those samples. So we'll either collect twin uh, pots or we'll take the cells out and send the unit. We haven't worked out the logistics of that, but it, tra it trusts for seven days. So we should be able to do both tests and we're setting up in our center. So we've been given approval to consider this as a service development, not research. So we can start actually using it in real life because the assay is already established. We're just doing it on a slightly different sample of tissue. Uh, and we've got the urologists on board, Bavan and Arjun, who are actually not only picking up the pieces when we spot cases, we've only just spotted, spotted one so far, which basically we've had one, this one case was a kind of borderline. It was just a little bit positive, then it went away, then it came back and went away. We couldn't find anything in the renal tract except an old cyst in the kidney. So we're just gonna follow her for another few months, but clearly we're gonna get these kind of borderline cases. Some of these might just disappear of their own accord. You heard from Ian earlier, these tumors can be killed by the immune system. So it might be that you get one and then it goes away again. But we'll work that out by doing some sampling. Uh, and so we're basically up and running now and uh, we've got uh, about 100 samples through. And the other big news of the week is that we, I met with Kevin Monaghan online yesterday uh, and they're already consented to collect urine. So we're also going to start testing the samples from the MSS2 gene carriers in uh, St. Mark's. So we'll be teaming up with Manchester on the Guiney project somehow um, and we'll also team up with St. Mark's to start doing theirs. And obviously as you heard from Rakesh we need to kind of get this set up as a national study but that needs a bit of legwork and obviously we'll need to put that together. So people with LS can develop kidney, uh, urinary tract cancers and it's biggest in MSH2 gene carriers. We don't have an effective strategy. We found MSI high DNA in the urine of people with cancer. We've started a pilot clinic following the hematuria pathway and the assay works. False positives look to be rare. And we plan a national study to show sensitivity and specificity and we want LSUK to help us co-produce that. Uh, so as you've heard already from the earlier presentations, we need feedback on the best way of actually implementing this uh, so that it's the least intrusive on people's lives. Thank you.